Welcome back, everyone. Sorry about Grimm. She's been on a bit of a movie kick lately. Last night she downloaded every single Akira Kurosawa film she could find, and now she has some kind of bug in her system, so we won't be able to go into our usual full-length discussion. Not to worry, though, because this gives us an opportunity to look at something a bit different in regards to our investigation of Sekiro. And this time, it's something that set a bloody standard for an entire genre of media. So let's get started while Grimm takes the chance to update her antivirus. Also, spoiler warnings ahead for a 60-year-old samurai film in case you haven't seen it yet. So as you probably realized fairly quickly, Sekiro is a bloody game. It's to be expected considering Sekiro practically cuts the population of Ashina in half single-handedly. Even still, the human body's not designed to spray blood quite like it's depicted in the game. I mean, I'm not exactly sure what's in the waters of Ashina, but I can tell you it's definitely not good for your blood pressure. But that's not really uncommon. There are certainly tons of other games or films that make use of this same gratuitous blood spray. I mean, it definitely makes for a more visually appealing death scene. But where did this trope originate from? Surprisingly, its origins are linked to Japan as well. One possible origin for it comes from the traditional Japanese art of kabuki. Essentially, it's a style of theater which focuses heavily on the performance and drama, especially when compared to more traditional theater. Kabuki is also known to utilize inventive ways to illustrate particularly dramatic scenes. As a result, death scenes are usually represented in a number of over-the-top and dramatic ways. This can make such scenes much more visually stimulating, but more importantly, it keeps the audience from focusing on the death of the character itself. After all, a death scene acted out on stage in a very realistic manner would be disturbing and take enjoyment of the show away from its viewers. As a result, the use of these over-the-top death scenes actually let us relax because it shows us that nobody is actually harmed. Now, Kabuki has a number of ways in which they can illustrate these dramatic deaths, and one such way uses red silk thrown in the air to indicate blood, and this could be seen as the origin of such an idea. After all, just replace the silk with real blood and you have a scene that is slightly more realistic, but still over-the-top enough that you hopefully aren't disturbed by it. But even if someone had wanted to create such a scene, there were two big obstacles to doing so at the time. The first was the technical limitations on how to create such an impressive fountain of blood. The second reason is that for a long time, bloodshed was heavily frowned upon in different forms of media. What makes it interesting is that the first time these obstacles were overcome on film, it was somewhat by accident. The film which helped to change everything was a movie called Sanjiro. Sanjiro is a 1962 film by Akira Kurosawa that tells the tale of a ronin, a wandering samurai, pulled into the local politics of a clan. I'll try to avoid saying too much about it, but essentially the plot involves Sanjiro trying to stop the plans of a corrupt clan superintendent, and in the process, he often finds himself at odds with a henchman by the name of Hanbei. No, not that Hanbei Grimm. Anyway, Hanbei ends up humiliated by Sanjiro by the end of the film, and demands a duel to try and save face. Sanjiro tries to dissuade Hanbei, but he refuses, and in the ensuing duel, he is cut down in one excessively bloody stroke. The blood spray itself was intentional. It made use of colored chocolate syrup under pressure to achieve the effect. What wasn't intentional was just how powerful the blood spray would be. The actor playing Hanbei, Tatsuya Nakadai, said he had to fight against the pressure to avoid being lifted off the ground. However, to the credit of every actor in the scene, none of them broke character because of it. Afterwards, Kurosawa declared that there would be no reshoot of the scene. You see, none of the actors had gone into the scene knowing exactly what to expect, and their genuine reactions made the scene much more authentic in his eyes. He said if they were to reshoot, then the reactions wouldn't be the same since they would be anticipating it. As a result, Sanjiro, a movie that was bloodless up until this particular scene, was left with a spectacularly bloody finish, and movie history was made. It's no surprise the effect went over so well. It went so far in the other direction of the film's previously bloodless deaths that the effect was shocking without being graphic. Once that line had been crossed, however, there was no going back, and movies have made use of excessive blood ever since. So by analyzing the origins of this effect, we can see why Sekiro chose to make use of it as well. The excessive blood highlights the violence being displayed while also maintaining a kind of cold distance from such acts. This allows us to infer a lot about Sekiro as a character. Watching as he stands, covered in blood and with little expression on his face other than a grim determination, he commits these acts of violence, but he doesn't revel in it, since, as the game tells us, that is the path of Shura. Instead, he fights to avoid the draw of such bloodlust, and so he is able to keep his composure and avoid the sculptor's tragic fate. In a broader sense, though, this also shows us just how influential our art can be to our culture as a whole. One accidental effect turned into the inspiration for a million other effects like it and changed our portrayal of violence in film ever since. It's a good reminder that even the littlest things can have far-reaching effects, for better or worse. 
Oh, are you starting to feel a little bit better now, Grim? Good. Hopefully you'll be ready for another in-depth look into the folklore and history of Sekiro next time. Until then, everyone.